We return now to our lead story, the questions still surrounding the deaths of four American soldiers in Niger this month. The details of what led to the ambush remain murky. This afternoon, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, General Joseph Dunford, said the military owed the families of the fallen and the American people answers. He laid out what is known now and what remains obscured by the fog of conflict. Early on the morning of 3rd October, as I mentioned, U.S. forces accompanied that Nigerian unit on a reconnaissance mission to gather information. The assessment by our leaders on the ground at that time was that contact with the enemy was unlikely. Mid-morning on October 4th, the patrol began to take fire as they were returning to their operating base. Approximately one hour after taking fire, the team requested support. And within minutes, a remotely piloted aircraft arrived overhead. Within an hour, French Mirage jets arrived on station. And then later that afternoon, French attack helicopters arrived on station and a Nigerian quick reaction force arrived in the area where our troops were in contact with the enemy. During a firefight, two U.S. soldiers were wounded and evacuated by French air to Niamey, and that was consistent with the casualty evacuation plan that was in place for this particular operation. Three U.S. soldiers who were killed in action were evacuated on the evening of 4 October, and at that time, Sergeant LaDavid Johnson was still missing. On the evening of 6 October, 6 October, Sergeant Johnson's body was found and subsequently evacuated. From the time the firefight was initiated until Sergeant Johnson's body was recovered, French, Nigerian, or U.S. forces remained in that area. Let's keep in mind, although I talked about enemy contact being unlikely on this particular mission, the reason why we're in West Africa is because of the area of concentration of ISIS and Al-Qaeda. The reason why our special operations forces are operating in Libya is because there is a threat of ISIS attacks from Libya. The reason they're in East Africa is because there's an Al-Qaeda and a smaller ISIS presence there. So uh, to the extent that they're taking risk, we have sent them there to operate in areas uh, within which there are extremist elements that if we weren't conducting operations, our judgment is that they would plant, be at the capability to plan and conduct operations against the homeland, the American people, or our allies. This is mission creep. In our judgment, we're dealing with global threats in Al-Qaeda, in ISIS, and other, in other groups. And the theory uh, of the case of our strategy is to be able to put pressure on them simultaneously wherever they are. And as importantly, to anticipate where they will be and to make sure that where they are and where they will be when they get there, they're confronted by local security forces that have the ability to meet the challenges associated with al-Qaeda, ISIS, and other groups. Aside from the answers the Pentagon is seeking, President Trump's response to the families of the fallen has drawn sharp criticism. This morning, Maisha Johnson, the widow of Sergeant La David Johnson, spoke of her frustration with the president's call of condolence. He couldn't remember my husband's name. The only way he remembered my husband's name because he told me he had my husband report in front of him. And that's when he actually said La David. I heard him stumbling on trying to remember my husband's name. And that was hurting me the most because if my husband is out here fighting for our country and he risks his life for our country, why can't you remember his name? We take a look now at what these special forces were doing at the time they were killed and the overall mission in Niger with New York Times Pentagon reporter Eric Schmidt. And Laura C., she is an assistant professor of government at Colby College, where she focuses on African politics and conflicts. Welcome to you both. Eric Schmidt, you've been following this story from the beginning. What did you learn today from what General Dunford said? Well, as your report indicated, still many of the most important questions remain unanswered. But what the general did say was that these kind of missions in Africa are now under review. They'll continue as scheduled, these advise and assist missions, and these training missions, if you will. But the Pentagon is going to take a long, hard look at the kind of support that these teams get when they go out. We also learned that it took about an hour before the team came, after we came under fire, called for help. We still don't know what happened during that hour, whether they thought they could handle the threat on their own, uh, whether there were some of the injuries took place within that hour, we just don't know. So those are two of the main things we learned today. Laura C., uh, you've been able to listen to what General Dunford said, did you? And you've been following this, of course, too. What did you learn that raises more questions for you? 
Well, I think that we, we learned that um, there was more assistance initially available to these forces in the field once they ask for help. As Eric has pointed out, it did take an hour, and that, that is a big question as to why we don't know what happened during that hour. Um, but they did have almost immediate drone support, and the French were able to get there very rapidly. Uh, so the fact that one of the soldiers did become separated, that something happened in the recovery of the body, those those are still open questions. But it's, it's clear to me that the Pentagon both is conducting an investigation and also realizes the importance of doing so and realizes the importance of getting answers, uh, not least for the families of the fallen. Eric Schmidt, it, 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 I think there were a lot of questions from the reporters today about, about the length of time that it took uh, that the the when the when the group was was first attacked that he said it took an hour then it took a half an hour for the French uh, to uh, acknowledge the request for help and then another half an hour it seems like a long time uh, it, it, I mean are there any theories going on right now about about all this well again what it indicates is that this is a part of the world the African continent particularly this very austere part of West Africa where the U.S operates in these relatively small teams of special forces with very scarce resources, uh, scarce reconnaissance resources, medevac capabilities. This is not a full-blown battlefield like Iraq or Afghanistan, where you'd have a lot more American assets. They had to rely on allies that were in the region, both Nigerian and French allies. And I think they've uh, improved this capability over the last two years, according to the sources I've talked to. But it's still, it's, it's long from the so-called golden hour uh, that the troops in, in battlefields uh, honor when they, when they get injured. That's the, uh, the so-called golden hour to evacuate wounded. This, in this case, it took uh, more than two hours from the time that they initially came into contact. And again, to stress, we don't know when these soldiers were injured, but it took a while for them to be evacuated. Laura C., how large is the uh, militant presence, whether it's an ISIS affiliate or an al-Qaeda affiliate, uh, in that part of the African continent? So these are, these are very complicated questions, and we don't actually know because there are so many groups involved. Um, we do know that the group that attacked um, American and Nigerian forces in this particular instance was probably around 50 people. Um, but the size of the group that they're associated with, the Islamic State in the Greater Sahara, um, you know, it, it's an um, amorphous group that is constantly changing, constantly bringing in members. People um, have falling outs and go and join or start their others. They merge together. And so the number of threats that American forces are dealing with in Niger and in the region is, is very unpredictable. Um, we are talking about several thousands of, of forces in some cases, but um, you know it can vary from day to day. And it's not a guarantee that if you're attacked one day by one particular group, that that's the same group you'll be dealing with a week or a month or a year later. I was struck, uh, Eric Schmidt, today and, and, and over the weekend in hearing how many members of Congress said they weren't even aware the U.S. had forces uh, in Niger uh, taking on this mission. It's not that it was operating in secret, so how do you explain that? Well, actually, there are about 6,000 American troops on the continent. All About 4,000 of them are in Djibouti in the east on the Horn of Africa, so the other 2,000 are spread over maybe 50 other countries. Uh, there are 800 in Niger, and the bulk of them are uh, working at a couple of different drone bases. Uh, these are uh, surveillance drone operations through that region. But I think what it also says is that a lot of these missions are going on in Africa uh, without uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of notice. I mean, it doesn't, see, doesn't mean they're secret. It just means that most of them are going on uh, in, in a very unobserved way, both by members of Congress and the public, until you have a tragedy like this. And Laura C., how much, I mean, did, were you aware of what was going on there as, a, as an academic who pays attention closely to this? Uh, because, again, I think many Americans have been caught off guard by this entire incident. I agree. I think most Americans were not aware. Um, I am aware. I'm, I'm writing a book on um, the the way that U.S. security policy has changed over the past 20 years in Africa, and, and this is certainly a huge part of it. But I do think this is something that that came about as a surprise to many Africa to many Americans about the presence in Africa. And I think many Americans would be surprised to learn um, some of the statistics that Eric just quoted that this is not just an operation in Niger, but that there are American forces of varying size. I mean, some of these deployments are very very small. You know six, eight, ten people. Um, but they're going on all across the continent in all kinds of murky missions that we may or may not be aware of. And I think that this speaks to some of the challenges with this, this idea of a global war on terror that we've been um, under for the last 16 years.
And it also goes back, Eric Schmidt, to your first uh, point that the you're hearing at the Pentagon that, that this entire mission is now under review. I mean, I think that says a lot, about, or it raises questions about how much thought went into the mission in the first place. Well, this is an administration, of course, that's made it's one of its top priorities of combating ISIS wherever it is in the world. And the generals have been given more authority, they've been delegated more authority, and there's been very forward-leaning. Secretary Mattis said over the weekend, for instance, that they were going to be stepping up activities in Africa. I think what you heard from General Dunford today was going to say, we're going to look at these kind of missions and, you know, we're still going to go after the threat, but we're going to have to maybe adjust some of the force protection measures, some of the uh, surveillance measures, some of the support that goes along with the troops who are out in the field in these very remote places. Well, it certainly has raised uh, a number of, of new questions uh, that we are going to be following, uh, and I know both of you are too. Eric Schmidt, Laura C., we thank you both. Thank you.